watching for a while what's happening in the US, um, the infestation and the response unfold. We've been learning. A lot of people have been really um, generous with their time and a lot of those people are in the room, um, helpful to us and answering questions. Uh, so we're very grateful for that. Um, today, I'm gonna be providing an outline of some of our prevention and response initiatives um, and also trying to identify some of the questions and concerns we have um, in Canada as, as we watch spotted lanternfly get closer. So um, as in the US, spotted lanternfly has been making headlines in Canada. Um, it has been a regulated pest for us, federally regulated pest for us since 2018. Um, and things were pretty quiet for a little while with the media, but as we've had detections very close, uh, in the U.S. to the Canadian border, um, every time there, you know, there's there's a report that's close to the border, um, things get people get pretty excited, um, and and that's been true especially over the last couple of years. We have had reports of spotted lanternfly in Canada, um, beginning in 2020. We had reports of dead adults on trucks coming from infested areas. We've had. Um, detections of, of dead adults on pallets and non-plant goods, on plants and on produce. Um, and this year we had a couple detections of dead adults on cruise ships as well coming into our Atlantic area. Um, there have also been public sightings of live spotted lanternfly reported in, in Southern Ontario, um, but we have had no confirmed detections yet in Canada, um, just some reports and, and observations. We do think though, I mean, this is a matter for us of, of when, not if, uh, and the when could be, we thought it might be last year. And so now we're thinking that it could be this year. So what's at risk for us? Um, <clears throat> the areas at highest risk in Canada include Southern Ontario uh, and Southern Quebec, the interior of British Columbia, um, and perhaps Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, parts of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Um, we're, we're not entirely sure about that area, but we're keeping that on our radar. Um, as in the US, the largest impact is going to be on our grape and wine industry. <clears throat> so a couple of the questions we have um, are the, is the extent of establishment in Canada, for sure. Um, there's been some good work done by our colleagues at the Canadian Forest Service, uh, looking at that cold tolerance limit for spotted lanternfly, and the results are, I guess, pretty surprising for us. It looks like it can really survive those cold um, temperatures. Um, so that we're, we're worried that the extent of the range in, in Canada might be greater than we initially thought, although we'll have to look at, you know, the degree day information that, that's coming out and, and also the, the hosts um, that might be available. Um, and that's another question that we have is that long-term importance of some of the preferred hosts. We do have areas in Canada without Tree of Heaven, without Black Walnut. Um, and I know the research has shown that that spotted lanternfly can complete its life cycle without those things. But in the long-term, what would that mean? Um, would it lose palatability? Would pests predate on it more? You know, what, what will happen? Will it shift to other hosts? Um, so that's just some of the things that we're thinking about. <clears throat> um, here we have a map. Um, some of you might not recognize it because usually your maps at the top are just goes into the white void, I've noticed. But <laughs> this is Canada, in fact, on the map. Um, <laughs> and while there are grapes grown elsewhere in Canada, um, the four regions that are circled there are our most important um, grape producing areas. Um, in, in the interior of BC and Southern Ontario and in Quebec and in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Um, there, this is a, a big industry for Canada. In 2019, grape wine was the Canada's highest value added ag product, um, contributing over $11.5 billion to the economy. And it's also an industry that's, that's growing. So from 2011 to 2019, that economic impact um, increased about 71%. So, it's, it's a growing industry, it's, um, it's quite important for us. And those areas that are circled um, coincide with the areas at risk, coincides with our grape producing area. So 96% of Canadian fruit farms and grape production are in the area at risk. 
first spotted lanternfly establishment. And those two stars, um, that's also something we're concerned about, uh, that those represent the Buffalo detection and the Pontiac, Michigan detection. And they kind of border that Niagara region, the Peely area, that's the highest value um, grape and wine production in Canada. So uh, there's been a lot of interest and a lot of concern about that. Oops, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so we're also worried about impacts on the nursery industry, um, direct impacts on tree saplings, tree seedlings, um, but also impacts of regulatory control. Uh, so when we get spotted lanternfly, we're, we'll put some measures in place. So the domestic movement requirements that, that are going to be placed on the nursery industry um, and also potentially export restrictions, um, the value of the nursery industry, <clears throat> the export of, of that nursery stock to the U.S. is estimated to be about 150 to $200 million annually. I know our, our nurserymen are are really concerned about, you know, what are the requirements going to be? What might the restrictions be when we get spotted lanternfly? Um, we're also concerned for the forest sector, uh, the imports of logs to, to Canada, um, 2018 to 2022, averaged about 300 million per year. But when we look at our export value, you know, Canada exported about $33.2 billion worth of forest products in 2019. We're the fourth, fourth largest exporter of forest products in the world. Um, so the long-term impacts, uh, it's still a fairly new pest having been introduced in 2014, <clears throat> excuse me, 2014. So I don't know that there's a lot of clear evidence right now that this is a forest pest, but I think with it being such a high value crop for us, um, we are worried about you know, what might some of these long-term impacts be. And of course, um, you know, with maples being a preferred host um, and this being a sap sucker, um, we're also, you know, we have to be worried about potential impacts to maple syrup. I mean, when it's part of our Canadian identity, it's part of, you know, when you think of Canada, you see the maple leaf on our flag, like maple syrup's a big deal. Um, we are the largest exporter of maple products. It's a product that's enjoyed domestically, but we're also, you know, 75% of the world's maple syrup comes from Canada. Um, so we have to be concerned about that. It's just, there are a lot of questions about that right now and and what should we be thinking about what should we be telling those maple producers so what are we doing um how are we preparing um i think we've heard over the last couple of days you know collaboration is key and we've really taken that to heart um internally we we have an internal working group where we're bringing together policy and programs and science and our operational people and our comms people and collaboratively, you know, we meet every couple of weeks we have since 2020, um, creating some of the tools, our outreach and awareness, developing our surveillance tools, what will our, our policy and program look like, um, what's the best science. Um, so we're, we've really come together, um, all, the, all the groups within the CFI to, to get that work done. Um, and then in 2021, we also established a technical advisory committee. So we brought together federal partners, provincial partners, um, impacted industry groups, as well as invasive species uh, groups across the country. Uh, and talking together as a committee, we meet quarterly um, to discuss concerns and to you know, share information. We've also set up four subgroups under that committee. Um, communication, response and treatment, surveillance, and a response coordination group um, to, to try and fill in the gaps, avoid duplication, come up with some common messaging, um, you know, and, and do our best with the resources that we have to, to come to con some consensus across the country on what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And then more, more recently in 2023, uh, CFI and APHIS established a Spotted Lantern 5 bilateral working group. And we've been meeting, um, sharing information, um, sharing detection information. And one of the aims I think is also to harmonize as much as possible um, to try and have some awareness of, of what our requirements and regulations are gonna look like, share, share the science that we have 
Um, so that's been great um, and, and that'll continue going forward. Another big piece is, is the communication. So we've done a lot of awareness and, and outreach um, generally and also more targeted. So trying to reach some of those non-traditional stakeholders, rail and freight, um, giving presentations to those groups. So far, they've been very receptive. I have to say, um, you know, we don't have it yet, but, um, but trying to make them aware of, of, you know, what the impacts are and, and how they could help us with this. Um, so they have shared things on their websites and within their membership. Uh, and also just very broadly, you know, we've had social media and webinars and internally, We've, we've taken a little bit of a unique, unique approach where we've had webinars for all our plant protection staff, which is pretty normal. Um, but with this pest, we actually did webinars for all the food safety and um, all the animal health inspectors as well across the board because of the way this thing can travel, because everybody's out doing their inspection work all the time. We tried to give them the basics, you know, like when you're doing your job, if you see this kind of thing, this is what it is. This is who should contact um, that kind of thing. So we've we've done a lot of work internally as well. And with that um, spotted lanternfly technical advisory committee through the um, through that subgroup, they've come up with a joint communication framework. So they've already identified some common messages. They knew who their contact points are going to be across the country, um, so that very quickly. Uh, when we have a report, if we have a detection, they know who to contact, who the spokespeople are going to be, um, and have some agreed upon messaging already. So I mentioned earlier that there have been reports of spotted lanternfly uh, in Canada, including a couple of, of live reports. Um, I also mentioned that there's, there's a pest with a lot of interest in Canada. So every time there's a whiff of something on social media, um, there are a lot of media requests, there are a lot of emails flying around. So one thing we thought we could do is set up an observation table online um, to let people know, like, this is what we're seeing, this is what we're finding, we're on it, was it alive, was it dead? Because uh, there have been cases where a dead spotted lanternfly has been reported as live, um, different terminology is being used, so we've also tried to harmonize the, the language. Um, so we've put definitions of the language that we're using online to let people know what we mean when we say we have a sighting. Um, so we've had sightings and interceptions and the QR code there will take you to this table online. Um, but we plan to keep this up to date on a regular basis so that we have something to point to. Um, sometimes that's all it takes. If the media is calling, we're saying it's dead, you know, we have a reporting table, you can go and take a look at it. But it's also a way to be transparent with our partners. Like everybody has the same information at the same time, um, knowing what we're, what we're seeing. Uh, so we've established also a reporting page. So right now, because we don't have spotted lanternfly, we're encouraging all reports um, to come in across the country to this reporting page. And our partners are also directing people to, to this reporting page as well. Um, so we are asking when people report that they submit a photo and their email um, and, and some basic information, and then we'll contact them and follow up. We've also established a process for responding to those reports. So we know who is taking those reports in and, and how people are going to be contacting people and, and who's going to be responding and going out. The early detection work, again, there's a lot of out, outreach involved with this. Um, we recognize it's a pest where the public is going to be our, our, you know, our best advocate in reporting this. Is it not going to be necessarily CFI finding this? Uh, and that's what we've observed already. It's usually through an iNaturalist report or they'll, they'll reach out to us directly, but it's been members of the public. Um, we are doing import inspections uh, regularly on plant and non-plant material coming from infested areas. Um, we're also doing surveillance, visual inspection, and, um, and have some traps out as well. And of course, we're following up on all the suspect reports. So when we look at surveillance here, um, you can see we have surveillance points across the country. Um, we're surveying, I think, probably in similar locations to where you're surveying, right? So 
high high flow through transportation areas, um, places where people might rest after having gone camping in infested areas, uh, rest stops. So looking at that in combination with Tree of Heaven, um, in combination with high risk sites like vineyards and, and nurseries and, and setting our traps accordingly. So I don't know if you can how clear that'll go across, but the, um, the green triangles are where we have uh, actual traps and we're using those, um, they, oh, it's escaped me, but the, the bands where you flip them inside the bug, bug yeah, that's, we're using those. So we've got those across the country. Um, and then the, the purple is where we're doing the visual surveillance using Tree of Heaven as kind of an indicator. And then something else we've done with the orange, you can see those are our Asian longhorn beetle sites. And we've specifically asked for a spotted lanternfly to be added to the Asian longhorn beetle survey. So when they're looking for Asian longhorn beetle, um, would they also be targeting spotted lanternfly? And they're doing that you know, through the winter months looking for signs and symptoms. So they're targeting egg masses this time of year. This is a snapshot. Um, there'll be more sites added. Uh, I think this is from a few weeks ago now, um, but this will be kept evergreen uh, in, within the, the CFI surveillance site. The Tree of Heaven mapping. Um, we're using Tree of Heaven to direct some of our surveillance efforts, and we're not sure we have a complete picture of where Tree of Heaven is. So something else we're doing is asking the public to, you know, if they have reports of Tree of Heaven to please let us know about that and report it. They can report it to iNaturalist or to EdMaps, however they like, and then we get a download of that information and can add it to um, our survey layer to, to better target some of our surveillance efforts. Another question that we often get is, should we do proactive Tree of Heaven removal or control? Um, and we haven't been sure what to say about that. And I, I think some of the provinces are thinking about that as well when they're thinking of best management practices. So is there a different answer depending on whether it's in a woodlot or next to a vineyard um, or next to a nursery? At the moment, you know, we, we're not using it. Um, we're using it to direct our surveillance. So do we wanna keep those sites that we, so we have an early idea of where it's coming in? Um, so it's something that we're still struggling with a little bit is, is what we should say about that. If I had been here last year, I would have said we don't have any registered pesticides available in Canada uh, for spotted lantern fly. And a lot of work has happened since that time. Um, we do now have treatment options for crops and, and non-crop areas. Um, so there's been a lot of good proactive work on the, the treatment side of things. Um, we do have flu pyrodifurone as an emergency use registration on um, landscape and ornamental trees. And we're anticipating that we'll have that product available for crop and non-crop um, as a minor use um, in, the, in the coming months. Um, our pest management regulatory agency is looking at that right now and um, is expecting a decision fairly soon. We do have oils approved for use on egg masses. Um, and we do have fenproprothin and um, a potassium salt of fatty acids available uh, in, in fruit crops. Um, so while we're very pleased that we have some products available before spotted lanternfly has, has come and, and we're continue to look at what else could we have available, um, we do recognize that we have limited pest control product options and we don't have any systemic. So bifenthrin in Canada was deregistered. That is not gonna be something that will be considered for registration. Um, Dinotefuran is only available as an emergency use right now for hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, but that is a product that we're talking to the registrants about. They've, they've said that they're, they think they can support it at this point based on what we've asked as a basal bark spray only. So, but for us, that's, we're very, you know, that, that's great. <laughs> so we're continuing to pursue that and we're, we don't know when we'll have that, you know, there are a lot of questions still, a lot of logistics to work out with that. Um, but at least we haven't had a, a no, an outright no at this point. So we're still pursuing that. Um, and there was a product submitted for, for use, uh, Bovaria product, uh, BioTitan as well. Um, so we're hoping that that will get through as well. But of course, we, you know, without the spotted lanternfly, 
um, we're not we're not going to be using that in great quantities until we would have a population of spotted lantern fly around. We also have uh, requirements for goods moving with spotted lantern fly. So generally, as a federally regulated pest, it's prohibited from being imported or moved within the country. Um, but in the winter of 2022, 2023, we did go out with a risk management document that outlined, um, you know, gave a summary of the pest risk assessment for Canada. Um, and it gave some of the management options for the highest risk commodities. And through the consultation process, we've now last fall published it as a decision document with the intent to regulate um, deciduous logs bark and woody nursery stock. Um, so the next step for that is to de develop the directive that outlines the specific requirements for those uh, products or those commodities. So for nursery stock, the, the requirements for that were already in place in July of 2021. So all nursery stock coming from the US needs a phytosanitary certificate um, with an additional declaration for spotted lanternfly. Um, and we've taken a bit of an unusual step again with spotted lanternfly. We're, we're trying to develop a directive with domestic requirements before the pests in Canada. So we can't, of course, say exactly, you know, we don't know what the regulated area will be because it's not here, but we're trying to give people a sense of what's going to happen, what are things going to look like, what can they anticipate, and we want to be able to react quickly, of course, um, if we have to set up a regulated area uh, to try and move as, as quickly as possible to contain it. So we have decided that for um, nursery stock and for logs, it's going to require a movement certificate to move within Canada. So whether that's visual inspection, whether there's you know a program associated with that that would allow then a movement certificate to be issued, but there will be movement controls on nursery stock and, and logs with bark. And for the import requirements for logs, um, it'll require a phyto or we're looking at approved programs for that as well. Um, just with the logistics of that industry, um, we're looking at uh, something in addition to a, to a phyto or instead of a phyto, I should say. So what's the plan? Um, that risk management document that I talked about also outlined our general response plan. So it, it, it told people that, you know, where we have isolated incursions, where we think we can be successful with eradication um, using the treatment tools that we have available, the CFI is gonna, gonna go for eradication. We're, we're gonna try and, and keep it at bay as long as possible. Um, but where we then have an established population, where we find an established population, we're going to move to establishing a regulated area um, and we'll no longer be ordering treatment and working towards eradication. There, it, it will go into more long-term management. And I think then we're looking at, okay, well, what does that mean? And, and working with, um, through that response and treatment working group on what will the response look like? What, you know, what are the options? What are the best management practices? So to support that response, um, we have a communications plan, a survey protocol. We have our internal response plan. Um, we do now have treatment options. And as I mentioned, we still have that collaborative collaborative response planning for the, the long-term management. So collaborative preparations have been ongoing for a number of years. Um, a lot of good work has been accomplished, but this is, you know, this is going to continue um, and have to keep going forward even after our first detection. Um, we also have to consider the U.S. experience, right? So despite all your good efforts and, and response and, and quarantine that this is a pest that has continued to, to spread and, and move. And Canada doesn't have a solution that you just haven't thought of yet, right? Like it's, it's coming and we're gonna have to deal with this. Um, so we're focused on really delaying the introduction into Canada. Um, we're not saying that we're gonna prevent the introduction, but we're delaying the introduction. And then we're gonna be looking to, to slow the spread. Um, and really, I think I've heard it here as well. We're trying to buy some, some time, looking for the science to catch up, have some better surveillance tools, best management practices, get some additional treatment options on board um, you know, while, we're, while, while that science is happening. We're, we're going to be doing our best to, to prevent it from coming in and, and slowing the spread. So that's the presentation, um, but I'd be pleased to take any uh, questions that you that you might have.
Uh, hello. Um, let's see, you had mentioned the Tree of Heaven control, and I was wondering whether that would be maybe especially effective along, for example, the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, I don't know. This is probably more of a question for the room than for you. Um, but anyway, that was a thought I had. Yeah, thanks for that, because I think it is a question that comes up regularly, Tree of Heaven. What do we do? And and do we control it everywhere or nowhere? And the other thing where we've asked the provinces to look at and do, can we control it? Do we have, you know, do we have products to control it? Are we able to control it? We have some cosmetic pesticide bans um, in some of our provinces. So what's our ability to do it? Okay, thanks everyone. Okay, next up is a virtual presentation, um, Concern for Grapes, the National Grape Research Alliance uh, with Donald Brown. And if you're on, I'll give you the go when I get the thumbs up from our IT guys. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, great, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Awesome. Um, well, I am Donnell Brown. Thanks very much for that introduction and thanks for having me. Um, although it virtually, I'm sorry to not be there with you in person, but I'm here to share with you the grape and wine industry's concerns. By the way, before I get started, can you see the screen and not my speaker notes? Can somebody confirm? I heard some voices, but I couldn't hear very well. Screen? We're actually seeing your notes right now. Can you? Um... Right. I had a feeling that might happen. Just a second. Let me uh, change that setting. Sorry, guys, let me just uh, Okay, how's, oh, let me get it going. How's that? Perfect, thank you. Okay, <laughs> awesome. I'm glad we didn't get all the way through and somebody then tell me that you saw my notes the whole time. So um, so we'll start again. So um, so I was asked to talk about the, the grape and wine industry's concerns about spotted lanternfly and it's pretty much everything you've covered on the agenda so far. So that, that makes a pretty quick presentation for me. That's it, thank you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so no, we have 30 minutes to chat about some things. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. I'll give you a quick introduction to the National Grape uh, Research Alliance and the kind of work that we do. Um, I'll share my thanks with you guys for the work that you've been doing on SLF and continue to do. As advertised, I'll run through some grape and wine industry concerns about the pest, and we'll finish up with some high-level details about a project we're hoping gets funded this year to address those concerns. So we'll get started. The National Grape Research Alliance, or NGRA, aligns the priorities for research across all sectors and regions of the grape and wine industry in the US. And that spans wine grapes, table grapes, juice grapes, and raisins nationwide. We connect industry, researchers, cooperative extension educators, and federal and state research agencies to initiate novel projects and programs to find solutions to industry challenges through science working together. 
Our mission is to maximize the productivity, sustainability, and competitiveness of the U.S. grape industries. And we do that by initiating and actualizing game-changing research of a size and scale that no one region or sector of the industry could tackle on its own. So NGRA is uh, not a grant funding organization. We don't put out calls for proposals and, and award funding for projects. We're not a research institute. We don't do the research ourselves. And we're not a public policy advocate. In fact, as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, we're prohibited from lobbying. But we are an industry-led membership organization. And that is that organizations that are interested in driving or influencing research to advance the industry voluntarily join the Alliance. And you can think of NGRA as a kind of strategic planning organization for grape research as our members work together to prioritize the next big projects to pursue and proactively bring that research to life. So who are our members in general? They're large wineries, small wineries, grape growers, processors, nurseries, vineyard management companies, grower cooperatives, state commissions, commodity boards, trade associations, nonprofit organizations, and specifically, these are our members. Um, you might recognize some of these names and notice that they span the country from California to New York, Missouri to Texas, and Virginia to Washington. So NGRA takes all our members' input on research needs and priorities and shares them as one unified national level voice to scientists at university across the country to whom NGRA is viewed as an important partner in initiating and validating research that supports our needs and to federal research agencies such as the USDA's Agricultural Research Service and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and even more recently NASA. And for these government agencies, NGRA serves to provide a comprehensive research agenda for the entire grape and wine industry. And in this way, our industry-led organization has been instrumental in generating some $65 million in funding for grape research since our founding nearly 20 years ago. This figure includes research projects that NGRA has initiated, and it also includes permanent federal funding for things like critical new facilities, staff, or research capacities the grape industries need. And Spotted Lanternfly is a good example of a broad scale big tent issue that's attracted the attention of our stakeholders. So some of you may remember this, this image. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to use this one to get your attention to make sure you heard the thanks on behalf of the grape and wine industry uh, for your robust response, uh, both to researchers and regulators to the threat of SLF. Since the pest first landed in Pennsylvania in 2014, you've worked to ensure that public awareness is high in infested states thanks to perv pervasive and high profile outreach efforts like this one, the SLF skit on Saturday Night Live in October 2022, which must have been a first for pest management. Your work has helped to ensure that research now points to what Julie Urban calls the right questions helping to accelerate our learning about SLF. And your research to date has flagged the pest as something of great concern for grape growers, ensuring they are appropriately worried and ready to do battle to protect their vineyards from invasion and infestation. Since grapes are the spotted, one, spotted lanternfly's number one favorite thing to eat. So what are the grape and wine industry's concerns about SLF? Well, generally speaking, uh, we'll start with this landscape of, of the grape and wine industry. Um, you can see here that juice grapes are grown along the shores of Lake Erie in New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan, and also in Eastern Washington. Table grapes and raisins are predominantly grown in the Central Valley of California. And every state but Alaska grows wine grapes. And since even producers in Alaska make wine, wine is made in all 50 states. And the economic impact of uh, the wine industry alone, I didn't put this on the slide, um, but that figure is $276 billion, that's billion with a B, 
as of 2022. So, the S, so as the SLF blast radius continues to widen, grape growers, winemakers, juice producers, raisin processors, everyone in the industry is aware of and concerned about the pest. So I've grouped some, some of our concerns in uh, under certain headings, this one being risks. So we're concerned about the, the range and rate of spread as, as the um, SLF continues to migrate westward. We are concerned about the variety preference for SLF and the risk of damage or the viability of grapes um, after they've been fed upon by the spotted lanternfly. We watch this boom and bust cycle of infestation where you're seeing um, high populations of SLF followed by um, relative quiet and then they're right back um, just as you got comfortable thinking that they had gone away. We're worried that they might, that SLF might be able to vector diseases um, since they're so prolific, you know, are there other things that they're, or are there diseases that they're able to, to spread? And there's also concerns about taints and toxicity. So taints being, um, is the, is, do SLF confer an off flavor in finished wine or juice, or might there even be some, um, some level of toxicity in those uh, finished products once SLF has finished with them. So management concerns include new plantings and replants. So um, as some, some of you may have presented earlier in the, in the summit this year, um, you know, new plants are especially vulnerable to SLF feeding and often um, in the in the middle of mature vineyards, there there's a need to replant vines. So, how do you time that, and what's the economics of of knowing when to plant um, grapevines? We're worried that we we may or may not have a successful um, detection lures, traps, and treatments, especially as the regulatory landscape kind of closes down on on things that that are um, effective. And we also wonder about novel approaches like gene drives, gene editing, and, and other things that can be done to, to alter the pest itself and to stop its uh, ability to mate or, um, or even its attracted attraction to grapevines. And then um, pocketbook issues. So understanding SLF's economic impact will go a long way toward engaging lawmakers in funding solutions um, organizations like Wine Institute and Wine America, which are both NGRA member organizations, can take these figures to elected officials to show the losses constituents are incurring from SLF's presence. We can also use economic impact numbers and conversations with funding agencies, whether at the federal, state, or regional level, to demonstrate the need for research funding to accelerate solutions. And the last two issues I've put on the screen here our areas, NGRA doesn't have any purview, but they're important to note. Trade hurdles are, um, Diana just talked a little bit about this in, ca in Canada. Uh, we've already seen issues in interstate trade with state quarantine slowing or stopping shipments of agricultural products at inspection stations at state borders. But international trade also is at risk. Um, California table grapes, for example, are exported to countries around the world, and each country has strict regulations on imported fresh market fruit. The last thing grape growers need is another pest of concern for regulators and inspectors to flag. So, um, and also this could apply to raisins, um, cases or pallets of wine or juice that could see additional uh, restrictions imposed by global importers. And tourism issues are, are high on wineries list. Direct to consumer on-premise sales represent a robust revenue stream for most wineries. Um, most of them offer tastings, live music, wedding rentals, dinners, and other special events. And a single lan spotted lanternfly might be pretty, but hundreds of them swarming on vines or coating outdoor facilities with honeydew is the last thing people wanna experience at a vineyard. The losses from grossed out customers could be substantial. 
So due to the volume of questions and the level of threat spotted lantern flight po poses to grape in particular, NGRA asked Julie Urban if she and the stop SLF team she leads would extend the SCRI funded project um, to a second phase focused on grape. To our relief, they said yes. And so Julie and her co-PIs, many of whom you've heard from on this summit, submitted a pre-application this year for a STOP SLF2 project officially titled Employing a Multi-Scale Approach to Reduce the Threat Posed to Grapevines as Spotted Lanternfly Expands Its Range in the U.S. Under Julie's continued leadership, the project is designed to quantify, S I'm sorry, SLF impact on grapevines and develop innovative management techniques employed at multiple scales in and around vineyards to reduce damage in areas where SLF is established and where it's spreading. And this includes indirect impacts as well, like juice and wine chemistry, insect contamination at harvest. Um, it also, this objective includes economic in assessment of multi-dimensional aspects of SLF damage, like the cost of sprays, um, lower yield, and decisions about putting in new vines. And the project under this objective will develop multi-scale spatio-temporal models that can forecast daily and annual SLF growth, development, abundance, dispersal, and spread. The second objective is to research fundamental aspects of SLF biology necessary to understand its basic needs, behavior, movement, and biological control to inform long-term sustainable management solutions. So the team will test SLF capacity to transmit great, uh, plant pathogens, determine grapevine de defense responses to SLF feeding and saliva, understand why and how the pest aggregates on vines, and determine the conditions needed to survive and thrive in vineyards. And the third objective is to de develop, deliver SLF management solutions to grape stakeholders, stakeholders of other affected specialty crops and the general public via the extension networks of the universities and USDA agencies involved in the research. Um, also NGRA and our stakeholder groups, uh, which include spe sector specific regional and state commissions and grower cooperatives and uh, the New York IPM folks. And that's all I have for you. I realize I went through that fairly quickly. Um, I know there's a, a panel of industry representatives following after the break, and I'm sure they'll have more to say and more specifics. Um, here's my contact information on the screen, and I think we probably have some time for questions if there are any from you guys. Um, you mentioned gene drives as a possible uh, part of the solution. And I'm just curious if there were any uh, like sp specific suggestions as to which gene drives you might be thinking of, just because it's of interest to me. <laughs> oh, good. Well, thank you. Um, you know, gene gene drives have been used in other other pests of concern. So it was something that that uh, grape stakeholders thought might be something that SLF researchers could pursue. Uh, I'm not um, suggesting that anything necessarily has been um, has come of that idea. <laughs> it's just something that that folks are aware has been successful for other insects, invasive insects, um, and wondered if it might be a solution for SLF. So if you're interested in that, by all means, <laughs> we we'd love to hear any any uh, hypotheses or uh, research that might work for that. Oh, I just saw there is a question in the chat um, about organic vineyards. And I, I have to admit, um, NGRA doesn't focus necessarily on organics or biodynamics. Um, so I can't, I personally can't answer the question about what IPM would look like for SLF 
for organic vineyards, but someone in the room might have some answers about that or um, even the industry panel coming up next. Um, that was great. And so we actually have a break now. I think we're a little early, but um, please meet back here around 2.30 and we'll get started back up with the uh, panel discussion. So have a good break. <laughs>